right. What is this? We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Secrets of Build, and I'm happy and honored to be with you here again for what is the full moon Sabbath, the uh, second Sabbath. Um, and thank you, uh, all of you that have uh, contacted me and shared just kind commentary with me on the release of the ancient Hebrew Enochian calendar for 2017. And I did just yesterday update and upload a video onto both of our channels, YouTube, Endeavor Freedom and Zen Garcia, which helped you to explain and to better understand how to utilize that calendar for the determinations of Kadesh, which is the time of the new moon and its link and connections to Sabbath and the Levitical feast days. And so I appreciate that and do encourage those of you that are wanting to know more about Sabbath and why and how it is linked to the determination of new moon to check out the two-part series that I did with David Carrico and John Pounders on the Enochian calendar on uh, Now You See TV, as well as the show that I just released on our YouTube channel yesterday. And thank all of you for joining us this evening. I have as co-host with me, Kathy Dunson. Kathy, are you there, sister? I am. Good evening, everybody. All right, excellent. Well, thank you for taking the time to also be with us this evening. Uh, I did want to share just a, a quick note that Carrie Cairns had sent to me uh, about the Enochian calendar. She, she says, um, thank you, Zan. I watched your presentation yesterday, and it was very timely, and I understood most of it. And yes, the link to the Navy Moon Fractions has confirmed that there are four months where the new moon day falls a day earlier where she is in wherever part of the world. I set the calculations for noon and hope that was right and all the feast days are the same throughout. And so this has all been a blessing. Thank you for doing the calendar. It is beautiful to look at and very high quality. It has really made a difference uh, to how I view creation and the creator i feel more in touch with everything and it is another way that i can be in the world but not of it and so bless you and so thank you carrie and those of you because so many of you have been sharing with me just um you know commentary like that and i appreciate all of you and thank you for opening yourselves to the possibilities of the work that we are bringing forth and have been uh for so very long but this evening is going to be a very interesting show in that uh, we're going to be talking about the passages that I just read from Isaiah 34, 14, and also Revelation 6. Um, and these passages, or 34, 4 from Isaiah and Revelation 30, um, 6, 14, sorry. <laughs> and so these passages, and when you come to greater understanding on them, they are actually describing, in my opinion, the firmament being rolled open in order to allow the Most High God, uh, Yeshua, to come down with his forces, all of his saints, and all of the angels, and that this is what it is actually describing and, and will show and verify that this evening from many different confirming witnesses. And we'll also be elaborating specifically on the occurrences of that day, as well as what is being um, related in the story and how it connects to the end of days. But before we do so, um, 
Kathy was going to bring forth something from about the full moon and uh, um, and also the full moon as far as the lunar eclipse that happened last night and its connections to a couple of passages in Enoch which describe something of particular interest which I shared in my new book not the latest one anymore but um, my 10th book, The Firmament Vaulted Dome of the Earth, and something that I shared there. And so, Kathy? Well, the uh, eclipse that occurred last night in, in Europe and Asia today, they it's called a penumbral lunar eclipse, meaning that part it's a partial eclipse and just sections of the moon are darkened by the Earth's shadow, quote, unquote. And I went out and looked at it. I mean, it was phenomenal. When Now that I understand the Earth's cosmology, God's cos cosmology, and I understand that the Earth is not reflecting sunlight. I mean, and I don't know how I ever believed that, except that I didn't think about it. Um, right. It, it was so full last night. It was remarkable. And actually, I saw a post Rob Skiba did on Facebook saying about the left upper left corner of the moon looked odd. So I went out and I followed it along for a few hours. But it, so now today I'm looking again at, at this because to me, what some of these things are very hard to wrap my mind around, but it's because I'm trying to break through the conditioning and still, I will look at some of these things, layouts of the solar system, and trying to put that aside and think, okay, what am I really seeing? And last night, I watched the moon all through the early morning hours. It it just wound its way around, you know, my world, <laughs> my corner of the world in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And, you know, I could see it on a disk. I really could see this occurring as it would on a disc, the, sun, the moon going around, and then the sun was going to come up in the east and go around. And I can't see it any other way. But I, I think, and, and the thing about the lunar eclipse is that it has been recorded for a very long time in history that the moon and the sun will be in the sky above the horizon at the same time. And so that completely destroys the heliocentric theory that this theory that the, the, Earth is in the center with the moon on one side and casting a shadow from the sun. So that is what we've been taught, you know, various forms of, of that for whatever the shadow is going to look like. So there's there are other explanations that we should be looking for. And that's what I say to a lot of the, the questions we may have, because there are answers. Um, I wanted to read just a little bit on that to maybe help others understand. There's a um, blog called Plain Info. Uh, I was looking for the link. And anyway, I've got the, the whole thing here. Uh, for the sun's light to be casting Earth's shadow onto the moon, the three bodies must be aligned in a straight 180 degree syzygy. But as early as the time of Pliny the Elder, there are records of lunar eclipses happening while both the sun and moon are visible in the sky. Even nowadays, the um, Royal Astronomical Society has records of this. And I think even Rob Skiba got a video of that. Therefore, the eclipser of the moon cannot be the Earth or Earth's shadow, and some other explanation must be sought since Earth is below the sun and moon above. And I've seen video, I watched video today, where they're showing... The moon and and they are showing a partial shadow coming down, but they're very quizzical, expecting looking back behind them and seeing the sun coming up, and they're expecting well the shadow should be coming up the other way. So there's so many questions, it just doesn't fit. So what was that about the glove and if it doesn't fit? Oh, anyway. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, and uh... we did that one show on Vedic um, cosmogony and. I mean, they, the Vedas, they had a, an idea that there was a dark planet, um, Rehu, and that that's what is calling the solar, causing the solar eclipses. And he say it's currently unknown in the Western world, which hides in the shadow of the moon. Rehu is relatively close to us, 
around about the same distance as we think the moon is, but it's completely black and it does not reflect light at all. So I don't know, would that be Nibiru? Sin, do you have any thought on that? Mm, um, they're no, different I don't, bodies. I don't, yeah, no, I don't think it's Nibiru at all um, because only because supposedly Nibiru only makes its appearance um, every couple thousand, it depends on who you ask. My friend Doug Elwell, he does, um, you know, wrote the book Planet X and the Sign of the Son of Man. And he speculates that it comes around every 2,000 years. Um, then Zachariah Sitchin, he, you know, talks about how it has a orbit that brings it into our skies every 3,600 years. And the Colburn Bible talks about it the last time that it came as being here during the Exodus. And so um, because, you know, the solar, I mean, the lunar eclipses are happening every year, right. that, yeah. that wouldn't be, you know. Okay, so that would be another thing. You know, I yeah, still struggle something. with the many supposed sightings of Nibiru, which I think are other things. But yeah. anyway, I think that's really interesting. And then in Second Enoch, and this is what you had um, talked about in your book, um, it says, On the fourth day I commanded that there should be great lights on the heavenly circles. On the first uppermost circle I placed the stars, chrono, and the second Aphrodite, on the third Eris, on the fifth Zoes, on the sixth Hermes on the seventh lesser the moon and adorned it with the lesser stars. So I think that that is of interest in the consideration because we know it's not what theoretical astronomy is telling us. Right. And what Enoch is describing in the particular passage, he talks about how um, that the vaulted dome of the earth is divided into seven regions and that in these seven regions the different planets have um orbits they have they are locked into their circular revolutions and i broke down all the names of you know Hermes would be of course mercury um and and then all the different aphrodite would be venus uh the different names saturn you know chronos so all these different names are connected to the different planets and that in not only that passage but others that I've brought forth and I'll, I'll bring I'll look this up after we talk about it but um that the sun and the moon are considered to be one of these seven planets which orbit above the face of the earth and that they also hold um you know, revolution around Polaris as the fixed star of the of the celestial night, and that all of the celestial luminaries, the sun and the moon, uh, and these wandering stars, these planets, they all move in revolution in circular orbit around Polaris, and not, you know, these other planets moving around the sun. Um, the sun has its own circular orbit around Polaris, and these other planets are not orbiting around the sun. And so that's what he's talking about. But he specifically mentions in that passage, lesser the moon, which in my, you know, the way I interpret it is that he's referencing the lesser moon. And so he's talking about multiple moons, that there's another object, another body out there which is a companion to the moon that is visible and which cycles through these quarterly phases and one that we are not able to see, uh, which is interesting because in Samuel Robotham, in his book, Zetetic Astronomy, he also speculates that there is a body out there um, because he cites in that particular book many instances where both the sun and the full moon are above the horizon and visible in the skies. Uh, and which, as Kathy had uh, talked about earlier, the, it totally negates the whole premise that it is the Earth that 
is casting a shadow upon the moon um, because of its being caught in between the sun and the moon and that its shadow is what is causing the lunar eclipses. And so um, because we know that the Earth, first off, is not moving and orbiting around the sun and that also that the Earth is never found in a place where it would be in between the sun or the moon uh, being the foundation for the heavenly luminaries, all of the heavenly luminaries move in circuit above its face in the skies, uh, in within the firmament. And so the earth could never reach a place where it is you know, in between or caught up to where it could cast a shadow on the moon and cause the lunar eclipses. And so we have to find a different reason. And in his book, Robotham, um, speculates that there is this other dark body which we are not able to see and which is responsible for um, casting the shadow upon the moon or causing the moon to eclipse in the way that it does. Whether it's a shadow or not, we don't know, uh, but it certainly does cause the lunar eclipse to happen in and it would regular need to intervals. Be- it would need to be the same size then. As right. The sun. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and it would be the same size as both the sun and the moon. Um, and, and, you know, for it to be able to eclipse it similarly, because Enoch also describes that the sun and the moon have the same dimension and are of the same size, which is why when the moon eclipses the sun during a solar eclipse, you, it fits perfectly, and you can only see just the rays of the sun extending beyond the what is the eclipse, uh, the lunar face eclipsing, you know, the so the sun's body, and so, uh, and so, yeah. In in finding this and discovering this passage in the Book of Enoch, I mean, I, I'm sure I had read over it numerous times, right. <laughs> but it. You know, it never registered with me because I wasn't looking at it in the manner that I had after discovering and learning about flat earth and the geocentric cosmology. And so when I, you know, read that, I was like blown away. I was like, wow, here, here Enoch is confirming for us and telling us exactly what Robotham has been speculating now for a uh, hundred plus years. And so... Yeah, I did find that fascinating. And I, what, uh, I've i been looking for it here in um, in 3 Enoch, uh, but I have not found it yet. Uh, I don't remember exactly where I read it, but just yesterday I was reading the third book of Enoch about um, Metatron, uh, which Enoch, when he was taken up according to this story, when he was taking up into the heavens to be a witness against the watchers, the Most High converted him into what is known as the angel Metatron. And he elevated him in status and uh, above all the other angels. And, um, and he describes this transformation. And Enoch also describes all of the various angels, their stations, their positions, but He talked about in this particular text, he mentions specifically in one of the passages, multiple disks of the moon. And so in my mind, that is also confirming as second Enoch in that particular verse that you read from, um, that there are multiple, you know, lunar bodies, which we, we can, we know the one that we always see that cycling through the various phases, but there is mention in both second Enoch and third Enoch of multiple moons. And so, you know, which that in, in my mind is uh, another confirming witness to what Robotham had put forth. And also, as you had read from the, the Vedic cosmology on the, um, the Srimad Bhagavatam canto number five and where, we did the the show confirming how 
all of the Enochian cosmology is also discussed and shared in great detail within the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And I believe it's specifically um, chapters 21 and 22, which speak about the movements of the sun, exactly as Enoch describes it in the first book of Enoch with the uh, the movement of the sun in the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries and also um, the movement of the stars as and that you know that the, there's this body Rahu or Rehu or this um, which again in my opinion is the lesser moon and so yeah there's confirming witness multiple witnesses on the veracity of the things that Enoch has been teaching and which have been encoded into his materials for thousands of years. You know um, how they say that the the moon is reflecting the sunlight. I did look into that at one point. I don't remember exactly what they said, but it was something about the dust on the moon that is the ability to reflect back the sunlight. And I also wonder why it is that we wouldn't expect to see sunlight reflecting off the thousands of satellites that are supposedly in, in orbit around the earth. I mean, they, to me would be a perfect conductor with, you know, whatever metal that is not burning up. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I just, I just think those things, you know, are incongruous and we don't, we don't ask that. And they also say that the moon reflects only between three and 12% of the sunlight. And they probably know exactly what's at the core of the moon. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just make it a joke. Yeah. It's so funny, huh? I mean, the lunacy of all of that and how we used to buy into and believe all that is. Well, there's just a lot of those little oddities, you know, like when the astronauts were on the moon and, and they weren't overwhelmed by, you know, the, the reflection of that sunlight, you know, that, that should have been a consideration uh, one thing that might be interesting, I don't know if it would be, it's it, its one thing that's always really vexed me, is the nature of light. One of the YouTube channels I've really enjoyed is My Perspective, Rory Cooper, and he pulled down all of his videos, but I recently found them, so I'm, I'm happy about that. But he did one that I particularly um, resonated with, and it was about the the nature of sunlight and how... Uh, sunlight is something we just are so accustomed to. It just fills everything. Like when you turn on a light bulb in a room, the light just fills the space. So the sun that's 93 million miles away, we're supposed to believe is this, you know, raging furnace. And somehow that's just filling up the, you know, area that we are, you know, in daytime on the earth with light. I don't see how that works. That was something early on that I was wondering, how is it that light travels through the, you know, dark vacuum of space and then all of a sudden, boom, it's, you know, it's all lit up, (laughs) daytime, Mm -hmm. breakfast, you know, get your cup of coffee. So, you know, those are things that that we don't think about as well. But he did a really nice video on that and, and showed how, you know, the nature of light is just, it's just there, or there are other characters, other types of light. Um, but that's that's another one of those things. Not many people want to go with that in that one, but it really is an interesting thought to me. Mm-hmm. Well, there's so much to consider once you start to reevaluate and reexamine all of these things. Uh, just like with, you know, what we're about to get into as far as the these passages describing the heavens rolling up like a scroll. Um, And for those that never embraced or looked into flat earth cosmology and the firmament, uh, it, you know, we just never even really considered, never even second guessed what it's talking about. Um, You know, heavens rolling up like a scroll and how it makes just so much more sense applying those passages to what we now know, just like with envisioning um, 
Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the this giant tree growing in the middle of the earth and how you are able to see it uh, uh, even to the ends of the earth uh, or Yeshua being taken up to a high mountain and shown all the kingdoms of the world or how when he returns in second coming that as the lightning flashes from the east to the west that every eye shall see him and in the the context of those verses those passages we just never really even considered uh, how it's impossible according to the heliocentric model of world but we had no idea that there is another model another basis for looking at and examining those passages all right we'll be right back everyone all right welcome back everybody and so we're going to go ahead and begin our investigation into the nature of isaiah 34 verse 4 and revelation uh, 6 verse 14 because both of these passages and i'll go ahead and read each so that you'll know what we're talking about. And I'll read uh, Revelation in context with a few of the other verses ahead uh, of it and, um, and following after it, beginning with verse 12, which is specific to the sixth seal. It says, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? And so we know these events are specific to the end of days and to the great day of his wrath, the great and terrible day of the Lord God, when the wrath of God is poured out on the wicked and those not written into the books of life. And that this is right after the, the, the church, the bride, uh, the wise virgins are gathered um, for harvest, and that it is then that the wrath is being poured out on the wicked. Um, and so we're going to talk about this in detail, but I wanted to share some of the Hebrew. When you look, in, use the Strong's Concordance to examine uh, some of these verses and some of these translations, and also how they are translated in some of the other versions. It's interesting. Um, I'm not going to name all of the versions, but you can go to BibleHub.com, type in Revelation 6, verse 14, and you'll have all the different versions all together in the same place. But the way that they translate them is interesting when you look at the context of how they apply to this particular, um, what we are describing as, in my opinion, the firmament being rolled back and open in order for the Most High, uh, Yeshua, to come down with his angels and with his saints. Um, the different translations. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up. The sky was rolled up like a scroll. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up. The sky receded like a scroll 
being rolled up and heaven departed like a scroll being rolled up. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled up. The sky separated like a scroll being rolled up. The sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up. The sky was split apart like a scroll being rolled up. The sky was removed like a scroll. Uh, the heavens were parted like scrolls. The sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up. Um, and the sky was split apart like a scroll. And, and then on and on and on. And so you can see that departed, removed, split apart, split asunder. All these different verbs are describing how the firmament is uh, opened in some manner or moved out of the way. Um, one other verse, the sky too passed away as if a scroll was being rolled up. And so the word there for the heavens, as far as the, the heaven or the sky uh, being departed, removed, passed away, that word is the Greek word oranos, O-U-R-A-N-O-S. When you look at the specifics of that particular word and how it is used in the scriptures, it has these particular definitions related to it. The vaulted expanse of the sky with all things visible in it, the universe, the world, the aerial heavens or sky, the region where the clouds and the tempests gather and where thunder and lightning are produced, the sidereal or starry heavens, the region above the sidereal heavens, the seat of order of things, eternal and consummated, perfect, where God dwells in other heavenly beings. Uh, the word departed is a pochorizo, if I'm saying that right, probably not. But anyways, uh, it means to separate, sever, to part asunder, to separate oneself or depart from. The word for scroll is biblion, and it just means a book, small book, scroll, a written document, a sheet on which something has been written, or a bill of divorcement. The word rolled up together is the Greek word helios, helisio, and it means to roll up together. Um, prolong, be, uh, to coil or to wrap up, to roll together. Moved is the Greek word kineo, and it means to cause, to go, to move, or to set in motion, to be moved. Uh, moved of that motion, which is evident in life, to be moved from a place or to be removed, to move, excite, a riot, disturbance, or to throw into commotion. The word out of, well, I'm going to skip that one. And last, um, place. And that one is the word os, or actually, I'm missing a couple of, uh, topos. And it means place any portion or space marked off as if it were surrounding space, an inhabited place as a city, a village, district, a place as in a book, the condition or station held by one in any company or assembly, opportunity, power, occasion for acting. And so again, this particular, in, in my opinion, what is being described in both of these verses is that because we know the firmament is a solid structure, that it's not just the atmosphere or the skies as they are spread out above the face of the earth, but that they are actually contained 
within the firmament, which is a solid impenetrable barrier, which divides the waters above from the waters below, that in rolling up the sky or the heavens, that the it is the firmament which is being moved or removed or parted or split asunder or divided and for some specific reason. And again, as we study the context of these verses, um, it shows us that it has connections to the return of the second coming of Christ and the wrath of God being poured out on the wicked. Just a couple, and I'll get you to comment after this, Kathy, but just a couple, in looking at Isaiah 34, verse 4, where, let me pull up the passage again, but he, in the Greek is a little bit different for this particular verse. And the passage there is, and all the hosts of the heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And so that word dissolved is the Greek word makak, M-A-K-A-K. -A -K. And it means to decay, pine away, rot, fester, to rot away, to molder away, to pine away, or to cause to rot away. And so being dissolved, being split asunder, being departed, being removed. Um, and the word for roll in this particular verse is a little bit different as well. It is the Greek word, the law. And it means to roll, roll away, roll down, roll together, to roll up or to flow down. And so um, to roll oneself, to roll away or to be rolled. And so this, again, this particular verse, in my opinion, is alluding to the firmament. And so I will share um, first a couple of passages which are cross-referenced to these verses. We see in Isaiah 54, verse 10, for the mountains may be removed and the hills may shake, but my loving kindness will not be removed from you. And my covenant of peace will not be shaken, says the Lord who has compassion on you. In Jeremiah 4, verse 24, which we know that that is actually about the antediluvian age, the same thing that Peter is speaking about in 2 Peter chapter 3, where he speaks about how the, the world, whereby the world that then was being drowned, perished. And it's the same thing uh, that is described in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, as the earth becoming without form and void. And in that verse, it says, I look on the mountains and behold, they were quaking and all the hills moved to and fro. Just a, another couple you really quick, and then we'll go into some of the other um, that are more elaborate in discussing what we are talking about this evening. In Nahum, it says, the mountains quake because of him and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. Revelation 16, then every island fled and no a mountain could be found. Uh, Revelation 20, then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence and no place was found for them. One commentary which I thought this was interesting from Jameson Fawcett Brown Bible commentary he is speaking about the word departed used um, in Isaiah 34 
And he says the Greek word was separated from its place, was made to depart, not as Alfred parted asunder. I guess Alfred is a different commentary. Uh, for on the contrary, it was rolled together as a scroll, which has been opened, is rolled up and laid aside. There is no asunder from one another. Um, and so we'll actually get into that, but let me give Kathy a chance to comment before we go into some of the more in-depth and uh, more elaborate verses that will you know, kind of summarize and bring forth to, to help uh, confirm what we're talking about. Kathy? Well, I'm continually impressed how uh, the revelation of the biblical cosmology of our world coming back to the forefront, and God had to have done that for it to be um, growing at the rate that it is, and for so many other and attendant ancillary things to be coming out, like the Enochian calendar. And think of how incredible and marvelous it is, and that is something that has been hidden from us. But but look at that. That's, that's so incredible. And here we are reading things that we can now envision. If you just look at the, the cover of your book, Firmament, Vaulted Dome of the Earth, or artistic work. I just posted a, a artwork that I found earlier today with the sky rolling back and the moon and the sun off to the side. You can look at these things and read the passages from scripture and you can you can see it and understand it. You can read the stars falling from the sky and you can understand it where before the believer and the unbeliever would not take the, any of it to heart, you know, or the believer to a different degree, probably just accounting it as a mystery. We don't need to know about that yet, or we won't know about that yet. Where the unbeliever just saying it's a bunch of fables and fairy tales. But now right. we can actually read this and we can find other texts, and you find so many now, you read them differently. Our eyes actually see, and it makes sense, it fits together, yes. and it's all coming from this now that I believe is, is a major move of God. I mean, not everybody will see it, but those who do and those who hear about it, to not be willing to look at it, I think is a major mistake because what you're being asked to look at is one, God's word, and two, his creation. And yes. that's how I see it. <laughs> and yeah, it's mar totally it's marvelous. It opens up so much. Like I'm saying, you just, you're able to, to see how those things actually can occur. Right, and so many people still are unwilling to examine this uh, this area of study and research. And yet, again, as you said, it is a it's the skeleton key for unlocking so much that has remained hidden or ambiguous to us for so very long. Just like with, um, you know the whole revelation of Cain being a son of the serpent, yes. uh, a child of the Nakash, how that opens up so much. Th this is the same kind of thing, just in a different manner. Um, and, and this is the way that God's truth works, is that when he gives you the key, the key for solving the riddle, and then in unlocking the discernment and having the Holy Spirit lead you in revelation with regard to this or other topics, those, those secrets then present themselves to you in a way that um, reading them and studying them previously, they cannot make sense because you don't have the key to unlocking them. And you know, so, I think the, the uh, first... Uh, quote unquote skeleton key that really got through to me in my initial awakening was Genesis six, four and the Nephilim, you yes. know, because that was, that That's was the first too. one for me. Right. right. But it's like, we're being brought along further and further, deeper and deeper. And, you know, the serpent seed, the bloodlines, and this is another, you know, and the things that brother Johnny 
springs forth. That's that's another turning things upside down. These are all God's mysteries, and we need to have a willing spirit, heart, and and a mind, and to be able to listen to God and not shut it down and say Isaiah forty twenty two. <laughs> right, right, right. Get it? That's a globe because it's right. not. Yeah, and um, and unless you have the willingness to remain open-minded, no matter how ludicrous or how anti, you know, as far as how against and being an opponent of certain uh, mindsets or theologies, if you don't examine them with an open mind, you'll never be able to come to discernment on anything. And that goes with anything, even with 9-11 and the examination of the conspiracies surrounding that particular day and the New World Order, um, so many don't want to believe that there are factions of government or the world which will in fact utilize conspiracies and, and propagate and perpetuate conspiracies in order to drive a certain agenda. And that's the way they work and the modus operandi for them is to make fun of the conspiracy theorists right. utilizing the media and in that way they can keep people from you know a willingness to investigate because they don't want to be looked upon as being fools or being one of those um tinfoil hat wearing people you know but they and- have the media and they have the educational systems it's government schools right. yeah that's that's where i was really involved politically back in the late 90s and that was because i had my son in private school you know the educational system was abominable but i had no idea then now i know so much more and it's mm-hmm. well and even beyond that i don't know why we especially as christians would not think that all of these things would be working against us. And we need to be in spiritual battle and aware and asking the questions instead of bowing to science and and wanting to agree and not be found ridiculous. I mean, because we are fools for Christ. I want to be one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, let, um, let God be true and every man... I forget exactly how the passage goes. Uh, uh, every man a liar. God be yeah, true to everyone, every man a liar. Yes, exactly. Um, but anyways, uh, so really quick. Today is the 15th of Shavat, which is the 11th month on the Hebrew calendar, the year 6003, which I covered all of that in the show that I just uploaded as far as, uh, you know, as far as the year and everything and how to use the calendar and it is the second, the full moon Sabbath. And so Sabbaths this month will actually continue to fall on Saturday. And then on the 27th of February is Rosh Kadesh for the month of Adar. And that is the 12th month on the Hebrew calendar. And then the Sabbaths after the 27th of February will actually fall on Mondays for the month of March. And so now we're going to go into two very interesting and very deeply profound um, stories and confirming witness to what I just talked about. And they will explain in greater detail that which we have laid down as far as the rolling up of the scroll, um, I guess, Probably I should wait until we come back from. Can I read one thing? Yeah, sure. Okay, I had shared this yesterday on Facebook and I shared it with you. This is something I've been editing a, a book for the new publishing company, Sacred Word Publishing. And this book is called Worship of the Serpent. It's a fascinating book and you're going to love it when it's finally published. And I thought I just. I'm reading it and I came across this one passage which really spoke to me and it speaks to me about the type of work that Zen does and often gets really chastised or castigated for. And it says, Osiris and Isis then are Adam and Eve. And though in the fable which records their history, other patriarchal truths may be confounded, 
Yet I think there can be no doubt of its involving likewise the events in paradise. I have brought forward a few points of singular coincidence and learning and ingenuity may find more. For such is the nature of heathen mythology that if under the heap of fabulous rubbish, we can perceive the latest, the least sparkling of a gem of truth, we may confidently affirm that the gem is not accidental, but that the rubbish has been heaped upon it. And I think Zen finds us the gems that are hidden, buried beneath the rubbish. I try. <laughs> but yeah, it, and, and Kathy and I were talking about this uh, as well, it, about how it is so very difficult to recognize the diamond in the rough because they're is so much disinformation, so much refuse, so much filth, and so much just just crap, you know, just right. built up and contained and veiling what is the truth. And a lot of that has been put out by the powers that be in order to hide it, to specifically hide it, and to conceal it, and to lead people away from it, detract, and just uh, to lead people astray uh, so that they will never find, never discover these kind of deeply insightful, meaningful, um, skeleton key unlocking riddle type of things. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame unto him. Proverbs 18, verse 13. One of my favorite verses. <laughs> Mine as well. And here's another one too from Proverbs. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. Proverbs yes. 25 verse 2. But yeah, those are all so very relevant as far as remaining open-minded to new information. Um, um, and, and to this... all the things we've been talking about. Go this goes along with it. It's a question we have about Nibiru, and which reminds me, you know, in the past, I was all over pole shifting Nibiru. We're going to investigate that stuff and, you know, go after that. And that, you know, as far as I can see, there isn't evidence for it. I, I did something different with Nibiru than most, except it was what you did. I looked in the historical text. And th so they're asking in chat now that we know what we do about the biblical cosmology. What it, What do you think? What is your bottom line on Nibiru? Do you have one? Well, this is because I, again, in studying all the ancient texts, that's my source for truth. Yeah. And in studying the Colburn Bible, there is um, reference to this destroyer, this object that comes in. And But what is interesting about, and I share this in my new book on the great contest, the war in heaven, in chapter 17, Genesis Revisited, I share about how this object was part of the earth becoming without form and void and the wrath of God being poured out on the fallen angels for the things that they were doing in the antediluvian times. But anyways, it says how... God allowed this object to enter into it within the vaulted dome. And that just like the, the flood of Noah's day, when the waters of the above were allowed to inundate the plane of the earth and to, uh, to basically submerge all the land, even the very highest mountaintops, that everything was submerged, that just as God allowed the waters of the, you know, of, during Noah's flood to enter into and through the windows of heaven, it specifies in the Colburn Bible that God allows the destroyer to enter and to come into this particular realm whenever he wants to bring judgment upon the earth or the people that are wicked. In the Colburn, so, does it say entered in through the vaulted dome? Yeah, it's be, well, oh, not specifically no. that with that particular words. But yeah, but it's very clear that it uh, he opened 
the dome in order to allow the destroyer to come in. And so what, you know, what Nibiru is, do I believe that it is a, another Earth-like planet that the fallen angels had inhabited and that they had peopled and lived upon thousands of years ago? No. I don't believe that any of the heavenly luminaries are in anything Earth-like, meaning that they are foundational and that they are a place of habitation to which people can live upon and walk upon yeah. and build upon. No, I don't believe that at all. But with regard to Nibiru as being some kind of object, some kind of heavenly object, which the Most High God utilizes to bring wrath and to bring um, judgment upon the people of the earth or the fallen angels or uh, to others. Absolutely. I, I most certainly do believe, and I do believe that it has a part to play uh, in the end of days and with Revelation. Uh, Beverly put in the chat room, I think it's Wormwood. I also agree that yeah. Nibiru is connected to Wormwood and that, yes, this object has a part to play on the great and terrible day of the Lord and the wrath of God that is to be poured out on the wicked. And so... Um, Actually, on the next break, I will look up that particular passage so I can share. Have it. you ever um, in, looked into any of Gil Broussard, Broussard's work, Planet 7X? Because he analyzed uh, the flood and some of the other events that would have been, might have been time. I don't remember this as well as I used to. Might have been time to Nibiru coming around. And those were different, you know biblical events does that ring a bell for you anything there uh, i know who you're speaking about but no i have never listened to any of his shows or studied okay, well, his work and the but, reason being is because it just in my opinion he is basing everything on the heliocentric worldview right. which i know yeah, to be he, completely he still wrong does, but he might he might be intersecting with some truth <laughs> Well, well yeah, that, as far as, you know, when those particular time or events, I mean, even the Colburn Bible specifies and links the coming of the destroyer to many judgments and cataclysms that happen to on the earth. But I know for a fact that the earth is not moving and yeah. it is not orbiting around the sun. So the Do whole that, premise of his work just seems off to me. There's a whole industry out there of, you know, Nibiru, Planet X videos, you know, it's nonstop. And, and I don't, I don't see in those, cause I look at them from time to time and I just, I don't see anything there that couldn't be explained better by Jeffrey Grupp. And so it's historically for me and what you're describing where I, I would tend to go and, and say, yeah, there's something true there, but it's not, you know, every Tom, Dick or Harry out there, Nibiru is coming and it's up there right now. And there's yeah, a lot it, of it. <laughs> it. It could be, again, it could be an object. It could be some kind of heavenly body. Uh, what it is, I don't know. It could be a comet, astro. I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is. But I do agree that it is something and there is substance to it. But, um, you know, again, with uh, Gil's work, um, it's just that because he bases everything and I wish he would examine and look into yeah. flat earth cosmology because the profundity of his work, I bet if he were to open himself to this as revelation and embrace it as truth, that he would be able to grasp in, in ways that he might not otherwise currently um, to renewed understanding of the work that he is brought forth in connection to heliocentrism, yeah, especially since we know yeah. that it is a false premise. Just like with uh, myself in having embraced uh, the biblical geocentric model for world and then reviewing um, the book on the courses of the heavenly luminaries uh, in the book of Enoch, then that I was unable to understand previously, but reapplying all the descriptions of the sun the moon the planets and the 
uh, the heavenly luminaries to the circle of the earth as backdrop, as the non-moving uh, stationary backdrop for the motions of the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, I, then everything made sense to me. And mm -hmm. I was able to grasp it in a way that, you know, for the last 500 years has been lost and forgotten because of our being swayed and skewed into uh, believing that we live in a heliocentric world where our planet is spinning once daily and orbiting around the, uh, the sun because all of that is false. And so unless you come to that realization, so much of no matter, you know, how hard you work to bring forth the truth, because it's skewed in that manner, it will never make sense in the way that it should, uh, just like with the Bible and our reexamination of it. Everyone's thanking you for the uh, planet or Nibiru commentary. I'm thanking you for that. And we can also place a little clip uh, on our new uh, site which has questions and answers from Zen. I wanted to be sure and plug that. We don't plug anything that we're working oh, yeah, on. Right. Yeah, um, Carol, who is uh, working with us, uh, C. Joy, she goes by, she's put working on the websites, uh, one for Sacred Word Publishing, and one that's going to be kind of a hub, where to go for everything to do with Zen's work. And she's put together really nice right now, uh, Q and A with Zen. So I'll put that link in the chat room, and and we'll be promoting this more. But I just wanted to let y'all know that. Good call, because I, I always forget to do that. And yes, God bless Carol and the work that she has done. It is amazing. Uh, and just so people know more about what we're talking about, I have been for I don't know the last few years have been saving the questions that people ask me in email or commentary and my replies to them. And so I sent seven huge documents of all of these questions to Carol and she has now been organizing them and posting them into this Q and a section of what will be our new website. And that, um, and so all of that information, all of those questions answered are now being put up. And there's already several pages on several different topics there on the website that people can review to get better understanding on these different things. Uh, because this is just one of the questions that I've answered on, on many different topics. And, and a lot that, you know, people have never asked me about or never thought to ask me about and and so you can go there and get great detail and um you know extensive elaboration my answering on some of these topics and some of these questions and if you review them you might find even the answers that you are interested in um with regard to these particular topics but well for those listening i'll i'll just tell you what the where to go it's www.fallenangelstv.com slash Q dash A dash W I T H dash Zen. And that'll, that'll get you there. We'll make it simpler in the future, but. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All right. And so I'm going to read um, this passage as far as the, you know, this particular verse, it, this is from the Book of the Bee, and it has connections to do with the firmament being rolled up as a scroll, and it also elaborates on the breaking open of the sixth seal and to the particulars of what happens um, during the end of days and during these particular events. And you can find it's chapter 57, I think, L-V-I-I. -I -I. It's in the Book of the Bee. It's the quickening and the general resurrection, the consummation of the material world and the beginning of the new world. And it says this. After Elijah comes and conquers the son of destruction, 
and encourages the believers for a space and a time which is known to God alone, there will appear the living sign of our Lord's cross, honored and borne aloft in the hands of the Archangel Gabriel. Excuse me. Its light will overpower the light of the sun to the reproach and putting to shame of the infidels and the crucifying Jews as soon as the life-giving cross appears before our Lord, as the doctor saith, his victory comes before him. Then a powerful light will fill the whole vaulted space between the heavens and the earth. Notice that vaulted yeah. space between the heavens and the earth. The radiance and light whereof will be above all other lights. And suddenly will the mighty sound of the first trumpet of the archangel be heard, concerning which our Lord said, At midnight there will be a cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye forth to meet him. At this trumpet the sun shall become dark, the moon shall not display its light, the stars shall drop from the heavens like leaves, and the powers of the heavens shall be moved. The earth shall totter and tremble. The mountains and the hills shall melt. The sea shall be disturbed and shall cause terrible sounds to be heard. The rivers shall submerge the earth. The trees shall be uprooted. Buildings shall fall. Towns and villages shall be overturned. And high walls and strong towers shall be thrown down. The wild beasts and cattle and fowl and fish shall come to an end and perish. And everything shall be destroyed except a few hum human beings who shall remain alive and whom the resurrection shall overtake. Of whom Paul has said, we who are left shall not overtake them that sleep, meaning to say that those who are found alive at the time of the resurrection will not sleep the sleep of death, as the apostle says again, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be all changed. As touching the heavens, some say that they will be rent, and that the waters which are above the firmament will descend, for it is not possible for the substance of water to pass through the substance of the firmament. That shows that it's a solid structure. Others say that as water passes through a tree or a piece of pottery and sweat through the skin, so also will men enter into heaven and not be prevented. And in like manner too will the waters descend from above. Others say that the firmament will be rolled up like the curtain of a tent. The second trumpet is that at the sound of which the firmament will be opened and our Lord will appear from heaven in splendor and great glory. He will come down with the glory of his divinity as far as two-thirds of the distance between the firmament and the earth, whither Paul ascended in the spirit of revelation. He will then make an end of the son of perdition and destroy him, body and soul, and he will hurl Satan and the devils into Gehenna. The third trumpet is the last at which the dead will rise and the living be changed. As the blessed Paul says, swiftly, as in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, when it sounds, and the dead shall rise without corruption, and we shall be changed. So swiftly and speedily will the resurrection of all men be wrought according to the spiritual nature of the new world. For the swiftness of the resurrection will surpass the swiftness of understanding, and the spiritual hosts alone see and know in what manner it will take place. Every man being suddenly found standing in his spirituality, some men therefore 
will have a tradition that the resurrection of the righteous and the just and the believers will precede that of other men who are remote from the true faith. But according to the opinion of the truthful and of people generally, the resurrection of the whole human race will take place quicker than lightning and then the twinkling of an eye. From the generation of Adam to the la latest generation, they shall rise at the last trumpet. And though according to the opinion of the expositor, many sounds will be heard on that night, each one of which is a sign of what will happen. Yet according to the consent of the greater part of the expositors and of scripture, three distinct trumpets will sound by which the whole work of the resurrection will be completed and finished. Michael, the expositor, and exeget, however, says otherwise in the book of questions, speaking as follows, the world will not pass away and be dissolved before the vivification of the dead, but the coming of our Lord will be seen first of all, who will come up with the spiritual host, and immediately our Lord's power will compel the earth to give up the parts of the bodies of men who have been slain and have become dust and ashes within it. And there will be a making ready and preparation of the souls to receive their bodies all together. If before the vivification of the dead, the world and all that is therein were to pass away, from whence, pray, would the dead rise? Those who say that the world will pass away before the vivification of the dead are fools and simpletons, for Christ will not make the world pass away before the vivification of the dead but he will first of all raise the dead and men will see with their eyes the passing away of the world, the uprooting of the elements and the destruction of the heavens and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars. And from here, sorrow will begin to reign in the mind of the wicked and endless joy in the mind of the righteous. Kathy, comment? Oh, I just, I'm really enjoying the text. This is in the Book of the Bee? Yeah, the Book of the Bee. Wow. That's an amazing, huh? yeah, it's an amazing text. Yeah, I thought, uh, because I was reading it just the other day. I, I you know, I, I read all these extra biblical books all the time, and I read them over and over and over. And it was, again, one of those that, um, now that I've embraced the biblical geocentric flat earth cosmology it read because i know i've read it several times you know right. i've read this book dozens of times um but it did not stand out to me as it did in this particular this time that i read it and it's because again i did not have the key previously to understand what exactly it was talking about and so yeah, it's absolutely mind-blowing how the firmament is connected to the the scroll, um, you know, the heavens being departed, uh, being uh, split asunder, being removed, being divided, and that it is in being divided and this impenetrable barrier, which has been in place since the second day of the recreation of the earth and put into place as a barrier to contain the fallen angels and to keep them locked into this world and, you know, not being able to escape that judgment is coming, that when judgment does come, the firmament will be broken open, rolled back in order that Christ and uh, right. the angels and all the saints that are coming with them with judgment to bring judgment that then the firmament is removed as barrier. I mean, uh, to me, that just shows that, in my opinion, and as I have shown in this um, new book, and as I have postulated the firmament, the vaulted dome of the earth, where I speculate that the the firmament was put into place to be a barrier. For yeah, um, for that specific it, reason. You know, in addition to affirming those things and, and seeing in new light, I also notice that a globe or a sphere, a ball, those things are never 
touched on or um, alluded to in any way. There was one part here that said the rivers shall submerge the earth. You know, that that wouldn't either. There's there's never in the canon or in any of the extra biblical books something that would make me think, oh, I've got to consider that. There has not been one right. instance. Yeah. Right. So, but myriad instances where we think, oh, wow, this is something else that's telling me it's exactly designed that way. It's it's a plane. It's, you know, it's the firmament above. And I, I just can't see it anymore. So, Yeah, just like this passage, you know, we'll fill the whole vaulted space between the heavens yes. and the earth. I mean, how do you get a vaulted space on a on a globe? Exactly. It would be fully encompassing, you know? It wouldn't just... Because the, the vaulted space, that's like... Uh, what you walk into a church and it has the big exactly. vaulted arched uh, ceiling and the dome above it. That's what that is. And so the other yeah. thing I noticed, I know we're going to commercial or break in a second. So I'll just throw this out. I watched a movie yesterday called Denial about the Holocaust and uh, something probably Eric DeBay should watch. Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know what the truth is. I don't want to know. But she said at the very end that there are these certain things that we know are truths. And one of them was, and the earth is a circle. She said, circle. And I thought, well, now that's really funny because it is. Uh, right. It, it is, is a circle. circle. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> they're putting those things in movies. That's a recent one. Yeah, that's a funny. It's a circle, like a nickel or a quarter or, right, or a disc. Um, yeah, or exactly. Plate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's so funny. It's I know. Uh, amazing uh, all these revelations coming out. Again, that, that whole Pizza Hut commercial where that alien is talking about his world and he's describing it as in the shape of a pizza. I mean, they're, yeah. you know. It, uh, there's so the pizza funny. reference uh right. and just in case there's enough time right now they, they announced today they're going to have an international flat earth conference i don't know if you saw the videos coming out today but um they've announced it for november 9th and 10th i don't know where it's going to be or anything but Ooh. conference uh Ooh. robbie well I, it's a it's a group oh, oh okay okay right. robbie and his group okay right. probably yeah, because I know John and them, now you see TV, that's going to be in April, I believe. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Uh, ben, I do. Why yeah. don't you let me just finish that real quick? So if anybody was sure. wondering, I looked that up. It's uh, Yes, it is. It's being put on by uh, Celebrate Truth, Robbie Davidson's group. There's a whole list of people they've already got lined up. Um, it's going to be in Raleigh, North Carolina, November 9th and 10th. And if you go to fe2017.com, you can find out all about it. Okay, right on. Very cool. All right. Excellent. Um, all right. And so I'm going to read the last portion that I wanted to share with all of you this evening. And this is from the Revelation of St. John the Theologian, which is one of my most favorite extra-biblical texts. I loved it so much, I included it with the, um, the publication of my fourth book, Lucifer, Father of Cain. And it's not the revelation that's included in the Holy Bible, the last book of the Bible. But it is actually a companion text um, that most people have never heard about, never read. And it's so deeply profound, and it covers revelation. It's almost like when Christ, um, after he leaves the multitudes in Matthew chapter 13, and the apostles come up to him and ask him to explain the parable of the wheat and the tares, and he tells him, explicitly directly in explanation without any kind of um, you know, dressing it up without having to decipher it in any way he just tells them exactly what happened that's what this particular text reminds me of as far as revelation that you don't have to you don't have to decipher anything you don't have to try to make sense of the parables you don't have to decode it in any way it just 
tells you exactly what's going to happen. It's so profound. I, I believe it would bless so many people's lives if they just read it. And you could read it in one afternoon. It's um take you maybe an hour. Uh, I've I've actually read the entire text on a two-hour show. So, um, but I'm going to read a portion. This is again Revelation of Saint John, a theologian, and this is about from I'm going to begin when Christ comes and in the seventh trumpet is sounded, uh, and it says that all the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and the bride goes to meet the bridegroom in the clouds. And then uh, you'll understand in the reading of it, the rest of it, how what is occurring with the opening of the sixth seal and those things that are, are being cited in Revelation 6 um, until the seventh trumpet, how all of those things connect together with the rolling away of the firmament and judgment being brought with the most, uh, with most high God, the Yeshua and the saints and the angels and and also what it means that the mountains are melting away and that the mountains are brought low and the uh, the oceans are brought high what all of that means uh, and, and it'll, it will help you to make sense of all of that in a way that you might not ever otherwise have considered and so revelation of saint john the theologian says this and then shall be lifted up all the race of men upon clouds, as the Apostle Paul foretold in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17. Along with them we shall be snatched up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then shall come forth every evil spirit, both in the earth and in the abyss, wherever they are on the face of all the earth from the rising of the sun even to the setting, and they shall be united to him that is served by the devil, that is Antichrist, and they shall be lifted up upon the clouds. And again I said, Lord, and after that what will you do? And I heard a voice saying to me, Here, righteous John, then shall I send forth mine angels over the face of all the earth, and they shall burn up the earth 8,500 cubits. And the great mountains shall be burnt up, and all the rocks shall be melted, and shall become as dust. And every tree shall be burnt up, and every beast, and every creeping thing creeping upon the earth, and everything moving upon the face of the earth, and every flying thing flying in the air, and there shall be no longer be upon the face of all the earth anything moving, and the earth shall be without motion. And again I said, Lord, and after that, what will you do? And I heard a voice saying to me, Hear, righteous John, then shall I uncover the four parts of the east, and there shall come forth four great winds, and they shall sweep all the face of the earth from one end of the earth to the other. And the Lord shall sweep sin from off the earth, and the earth shall be made white like snow, and it shall become as a leaf of paper without cave or mountain or hill or rock. But the face of the earth from the rising even to the setting of the sun shall be like a table and white as snow, and the rains of the earth shall be consumed by fire, and it shall cry unto me, saying, I am a virgin before you, O Lord, and there is no sin in me. As the prophet David foretold and said aforetime, you shall sprinkle me with hyssop, and I shall be made pure. You shall wash me, and I shall be made whiter than snow. And again he said, Every chasm shall be filled up, and every mountain and hill brought low, and the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways into smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Isaiah 40, verse 4. And again I said, Lord, and after that, what will you do? And I heard a voice saying to me, 
Hear righteous John. Then shall the earth be cleansed from sin, and all the earth shall be filled with a sweet smell, because I am about to come down upon the earth, and then shall come forth the great and venerable scepter, with thousands of angels worshiping it, as I said before, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man from the heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24, 30. And then the worker of iniquity with his servant shall behold it and gnash his teeth exceedingly, and all the unclean spirits shall be turned to flight. And then, seized by an invisible power, having no means of flight, they shall gnash their teeth against him, saying to him, Where is your power? How have you led us astray? And we have fled away and have fallen away from the glory which we had beside him who is coming to judge us and the whole human race. Woe to us because he banishes us into outer darkness. And again, I said, Lord, and after that, what will you do? And I heard a voice saying to me, then will I send an angel out of heaven and he shall cry with a loud voice, saying, Hear, O earth, and be strong, says the Lord, for I am coming down to you. And the voice of the angel shall be heard from the one end of the world, even to the other, and even to the remotest part of the abyss. And then shall be shaken all the power of the angels and of the many-eyed ones, and there shall be a great noise in the heavens. And the nine regions of the heavens shall be shaken, and there shall be fear and astonishment upon all the angels. And then the heavens shall be rent from the rising of the sun, even to the setting, and an innumerable multitude of angels shall come down to the earth, and then the treasures of the heavens shall be opened, and they shall bring down every precious thing and the perfume of incense, and they shall bring down to the earth Jerusalem robed like a bride, Revelation 21, 2. And then there shall go before me myriads of angels and archangels bearing my throne, crying out, Holy, 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 Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Isaiah 6, 3. And then will I come forth with power and great glory, and every eye in the clouds shall see me. And then every knee shall bend of things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth. Philippians 2.10 And then the heavens shall remain empty, and I will come down upon the earth, and all that is in the earth, all that is in the air shall be brought down upon the earth. And all the human race and every evil spirit, along with Antichrist, and they shall all be set before me, naked and chained by the neck. And again I said, Lord, what will become of the heavens and the sun and the moon, along with the stars? And I heard a voice saying to me, Behold, righteous John. And I looked and I saw a lamb having seven eyes and seven horns, Revelation 5, 6. And again, I heard a voice saying to me, I will bid the lamb come before me and will say, who will open this book? And all the multitudes of the angels will answer, give this book to the lamb to open it. And then will I order the book to be opened. And when he shall open the first seal, the stars of the heavens shall fall from one end of it to the other. And when he shall open the second seal, the moon shall be hidden, and there shall be no light in her. And when he shall open the third seal, the light of the sun shall be withheld, and there shall not be light upon the earth. And when he shall open the fourth seal, the heavens shall be dissolved, and the air shall be thrown into utter confusion. As says the prophet, And the heavens are the works of your hands. They shall perish but you endure, and they shall all wax old as a garment. And when he shall open the fifth seal, the earth shall be rent, and all the tribunals upon the face 
of all the earth shall be revealed. And when he shall open the sixth seal, the half of the sea shall disappear. And when he shall open the seventh seal, Hades shall be uncovered. All right. Um, I'm going to stop there for just a second and give you a chance to comment, Kathy, um, before we get you know to the end of the show. One and thing then. I was noticing, you know, in the beginning when you were reading passages from the canon and um, and also the definitions uh, into the the Greek um, and Hebrew, I guess in some of the Old Testament, I, I'm seeing a lot of those same descriptions here in in this book, and yeah. I, I find that really interesting. It's very confirming, like it was talking about utter confusion. I think that was used exactly. I don't remember which verse it was, but right. um, do you know or do you know much about the history of this book and why it, it hadn't been? Because you said it's very hard to find. And that's why you printed it in one of your books. Yeah, it's um, it's mentioned. It's one of those books that is debated upon by the church fathers uh, and it's printed with the anti Nicene. Um, let me actually pull up the. Because I didn't see what's so controversial about it in the way that the Book of Enoch is. Right. I, um, maybe I'm getting yeah. so used to it. I don't know. Right. I think it's right. just great. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's the source is translated by Alexander Walker from the Anti-Nicene Fathers, Volume Eight, which you know I never even heard of the Anti-Nicene Fathers, but. Luckily, I study everything, and this was one of the texts that I discovered. But it was uh, it was published by Alexander Roberts, James Donaldson, and A. Cleveland Cox in Buffalo, New York, in Christian Literature Publishing Company in 1886. But you know, I, I've never heard of it, never studied it, never had a chance to until the advent of the internet and. Uh, I had never heard anybody else talking to, about this book or citing it and referencing it um, until I, like, I discovered it. I like where you pulled the text from that we're reading from tonight because you, there's a lot of um, other scripture, canon scripture, that's um, reaffirming, you know, what is here in this writing. And um, I just, I like the way that um, it's, it's presented, you know, it, the way, hmm, I, I don't know. I just, it, it really resonated with me in a different way than sitting down and reading the book of revelation. So, mm -hmm. right, right. You yeah. know, cause a lot of, a lot of people in reading the book of revelation, they can't make sense of it, you know, what, but and yet it's like reading, they're wasting their time. But reading this, you're, you're reading the same elements from exactly. the book of yes. revelation. It's just in a, a little different way. It's decrypted. It's not yeah. hidden in parable. Yeah. Yeah. It was like so many of the other books that you read, like Book of the Bee. Um, right. Or Book of Jasher, Jubilees, any of these right. other books. It's just, it's another way of looking at the historical record, you know, without saying it's canonized scripture. I hate all of that stuff. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's the story of history and it's more detail. It's for those who are seeking and really want to know more about their God. <laughs> Right. So, yeah. And the creation. Yes. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. I mean, and, that's what it's all about. I mean, can you imagine if this was included as the last book after Revelation? Yeah. People would be flipping back and forth, reading Revelation and then studying this and be like, oh, that's what it means. Oh, and that's OK. Now I understand. And just yeah. think of how many more believers, you know, there would be uh, well, because they could make sense of it. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons why I think it's been hidden. Well, from like the us. first book, uh, is it the first book of Adam and Eve or the book of Adam and Eve? Uh, the first book of Adam and Eve that's is an the amazing. same thing as. Yeah, yeah, those are amazing texts. I Even just oh, yeah. this I one, uh, Reverend Dean, that we're going to do Worship of the Serpent. That is an amazing text. He wrote that in 1833, right. I think. And it's, it's all of the work that you were doing, but analyzing throughout culture, throughout history, how everybody worshiped the serpent. And then you think, well, gee, I wonder why, you know, right, right. it just, it makes so much sense. And 
people are not so much interested in in digging into these things and thank thank the lord that you are so that we benefit from that Find well you know it. you know what is interesting to me also is that when you read some of these older texts like like the uh, traditions of Jews by Johann Eisenminger, or the um, the legends of the Jews by Al Allen Lewis Ginsburg, or like even this that you were talking about with uh, John Dean Bathurst in, in writing about the worship of the serpent. All of these researchers, they cited all of these multiple texts, even like the Book of the Bee, it has all of these references, all of these footnotes to all right. of these other extra biblical books and texts, and they know and you know, the they Bible. didn't care whether it was canon or not canon. They wanted they, to learn, right? Yeah, they were studying from everything, which is exactly what I do, and yet I'm called a heretic for because I do that. Right. And to me, all I'm trying to do is give you all the puzzle pieces. Why wouldn't you want to know what all of the ancient texts say you know and but you know it's whatever. a thorough for forensic study it, it's, yes, it's sad exactly. that we do have to address it because it it doesn't stop but you know when you're over the target you get the most flack so that's right. the truth. yeah right and uh actually there's um i'm gonna see if i can find it really quick there's this woman that placed a comment on one of my one of my videos and I thought it was perfect the comment that she shared because she was talking about how you know truth is like a it's a giant puzzle that we're all trying to put together and and how um that's the only way you can do that is by looking at examining everything and uh if I can find it I, it's on my other channel but yeah I'll be able to find it here in a second and I'll share it and it's um, it, it was really awesome the way that she had put it. As well, well, people are so quick to say you can't read any of that, you know, and it's that's not how scholarship is done. That's I mean, think thinking throughout history. I mean, so where do you where do you stop burning the books kind of mentality? And I, I see that so much these days and, and I'm not sure what prompts it, but um it's very pervasive and it's a sad thing, you know, from what version of the Bible you're reading to whether or not you're going to look at the meanings of words to, you know, what books you're going to study. You know, it's like, you can't read that. And, and to me, that's, that's crazy. Okay. The book of Satan, I draw a line there. <laughs> I, I don't, right. don't want to read the grimoire. Satanic you know, Bible, right? Yeah. The, well, actually here's the story. <laughs> Someone gave me that once and I was staying at a, at a friend's house and I couldn't sleep with it in the house. I took oh, it outside goodness, right. and put it on the porch. I mean, I thought, Oh, okay. I'll look at it. If he's going to send me home. Oh, it's crazy. I couldn't, I, you know, I was, I'd fallen away at the time or whatever, but anyway, I won't read that stuff. So, mm -hmm. okay, I get that. But this is entirely different. Right. Yeah, these are biblical texts, you know. But anyways, I, I can't find that. So I'm going to just read this last passage from the... Um, uh, we actually do not have time. But I, I'll do... I'll post a link to what I was reading from the Revelation of St. John in the chat room. Uh, and if those of you that would like to please do read it because it's deeply profound and it, in my opinion it can help you to understand revelation and the end of days and those things that we're speaking about here in greater detail and i i believe it will most certainly bless your life but and, and i you know i want to say this about all of our listeners and those that come and listen to our show know that I really appreciate all of you so very much because you appreciate the research that we are doing in sharing all of this material, all the connecting links which uh, tie together in presenting the story of truth as we are revealing it and especially as I am um, sharing it in what is the Great Contest trilogy and um, it's you know, that, those three books, in my opinion, when 
and I'm almost done with the second one, so I, I, it should be out in less than a month. Uh, I think I'm through one of the last two proofreads that I'm going to do on it. But that's the the for those that don't know the Great Contest, the first book of the trilogy is the War in Heaven and how it ties together in what is the the controversy, the contest between the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and satan and legion and how they're being cast out of the heavens the sec the second aspect of the war in heaven is ongoing here between the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent and how the war in heaven now is contained within our bodies that our spirits are are bound to our flesh bodies which are you know a fallen state of being and that we are caught up in a fallen world and that the war in heaven resonates within each of us with our every day, our every activity and the choices that we make. And that the third book of the trilogy talks about the enmity as it occurred and, and connects to Genesis 6 with the fall of the watchers, the birth of the giants, the men of renown, and how it ties to all the divisions, the, the distinction, the differentiation of these two seed lines as they play out all throughout scripture um, from Cain and Abel, uh, Seth and, and Cain um, to uh, Ham and the Canaanites and Shem and the, the Semites uh, to Abraham um, and, and you know his children, Isaac and Ishmael being two different, considered two different bloodlines and Jacob and Esau and David and Goliath, Saul and Amalek, uh, Christ and the Pharisees. I mean, these two divisions of these two, the wheat and the tares, the goat and the sheep, it plays out all throughout Scripture, even unto this day and age with the New World Order against the, you know, the regular people, the lay people, humanity, the sons of Adam, and that we are seeing this play out even now. And so the third book will cover all of that but you know basically in my opinion when you can understand and to discern truth in the way that i'm laying it out in these three books the fullness of the biblical narrative and how it comes together with the ancient mysteries the uh all that we see around us as far as the conspiracy of the new world order all of those things tied together in one huge puzzle of truth and in my opinion, if you can comprehend and grasp it in the way that I lay it out, you will you can't be deceived when it comes to truth in so many facets, even to what we're talking about with the flat earth, biblical, and geocentric cosmology, uh, the lie of NASA, the coming of Antichrist, and all of this. Appreciate all of you. God bless. God bless all. Good night. Good night. Love. And Happy Shabbat, folks.